be seated. Well, if you have your Bible, I want to ask you to open your Bible to 2 Kings chapter 4. We were there last week, but we we're going to pick up from where we left off last week. Now, I just want to remind you, I just want to tell you, you know, I, I, I'm, when I sit down and I write this, I'm talking to people who have committed their life to Jesus Christ. I've, I've, I'm talking to people who rely on the grace of God and His love and His forgiveness, which is so free. Because I'm telling you, what we really need in this world and what the church really needs is that we need some Christian people who are going to stand up and be noticed in our world today. Satan has come to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life, and I've come to give it to you abundantly. And when he says abundantly, I don't know how you translate that in your life, but abundance means more than mm, what I've come to know or I've come to expect or come to receive. He's, he is an extravagant God. He is above any other God. There are no other gods like him. There are no other gods. And so he's speaking to us today. Now, when I sit down and I, I, I mean, when I sat down and I, I did this months ago in putting this together, but as I read through the scriptures and I came upon this scripture and I'm using this same thing, stop, stopping short, I, I read this and I said, God, you're speaking to us as individuals today, someone in the house. And as I put this on the calendar, I said, this was, this was way back in what, April, May. I said, someone on September 20, 21st is going to need to hear this message. They need to hear, don't stop yet. Don't quit quite yet because things are going to change. God is doing something. God's going to birth something. And I know this, that when I read through these scriptures, and I know there are people, maybe even some of you sitting in this room today, you're going, oh, that's the Old Testament. You know, that Old Testament stuff, that was then. I'm a, we should get into the New Testament. That's Old Covenant. We need New Covenant. Those were old times. We need new times. But I'm going to tell you something. God is speaking through these words. And yes, I absolutely believe on, without a shadow of a doubt that there was a day that this happened, truly happened in the life of this lady, in the life of this man of God, Elisha. But I know this, that the Word of God is not contained to just one moment of time. And as that Word was happening then, that Word is still happening today. And it's a prophetic kind of Word that He's speaking to us from way back then, reaching into our time and our life here and now. And he's going to speak to you. And I pray, and I've been praying all week that there's someone in the house that you're, you're living through this. You're, you've gotten to a point in your life, you're wondering what you're supposed to do next. You're wondering how you're going to handle the next situation. And God's going to speak to you today through this word. So if you open your Bible, 2 Kings chapter 4, I'm going to begin reading with verse 8. It says, one day, Elisha went to the town of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there, and she invited him to eat some food. From then on, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there to eat. She said to her husband, I'm sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Let's make a little room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. One day, Elisha returned to Shunem, and he went up to his room to rest. He said to his servant Gehazi, tell the woman I want to speak to her. And when she arrived, Elisha said to Gehazi, tell her that we appreciate the kind concern she has shown us. Now ask her what we can do for her. Does she want me to put it in a good word for her to the king or to the commander of the army? No, she replied. My family takes good care of me. Later, Elisha asked Gehazi, what do you think we can do for her? He suggested she doesn't have a son and her husband is an old man. Call her back again, Elisha told him. And when the woman returned, Elisha said to her as she stood in the doorway, Next year at about this time, you will be holding a son in your arms. No, my Lord, she protested. Please don't lie to me like that, O man of God. But sure enough, the woman soon became pregnant. And at that time, the following year, she had a son, just as Elisha had said. So as I sat down and I wrote this, here's what I wrote. Just about the time you think it's too late... Just about the time you think your chances have failed. Just about the time you think you should give up, settle down, calm down, or slow down. Just about the time you think you should throw in the towel, sit in the dark, dugout, park your car, give it a rest. 
I'm telling you, God is doing something new. God's birthing something you didn't think was possible. God's forming something you never expected. And God's creating something you never saw coming. Now I say all that according to this. Stop stopping short. Push through, press up, pull hard. Now let me explain to you why I just said all that. I'm going to take you right back to the scripture. See, one day, one day in the life of this man of God, this prophet named Elisha, one day he strolled into the little town of Shunem. Shunem is just an ordinary town. It's got ordinary people in it, hardworking, everyday kind of people, just like you and me. Shunem is not any special place. It's not some spiritual, high, fluent town. It's just a town in between Samaria and Jerusalem. And, and Elisha tra travels this way often. He goes through Shunem quite a bit. And in this particular town, the Bible tells us there is a particular lady. And the Bible tells us, in my version, she's a wealthy lady. In some other translations, it says she's a great lady. What is meant by great is, is kind of out there. We can make some references. Maybe it's in reference to her kindness. Maybe she's great in a kindly person. Maybe it's in reference to her compassion. Maybe it's in reference to her willingness to use her wealth to help others. This we know. She didn't have any kids. She had no son. We read that in verse 14. So maybe she was the kind of person that she adopted everybody else's children as her very own. You know, kind of like Aunt B, you know, on Andy Griffith's show. And, you know, I know some of you younger people that's in black and white, and you're wondering how that ever happened. Okay, but you know, Aunt B, she just took in everybody, like people put, taking stray dogs. Maybe this lady was kind of like that. She had this kindly heart that because she didn't have any kids, she adopted everybody else's kids as her very own, and she was known as a great lady. She evidently, she liked cooking, and she must have been a good cook because she liked having guests in her house, and they kept coming back. I don't know of anybody who comes back into a house where the cooking isn't any good. And because Elisha strolls through this town, she sees him and she invites him into her home to come have a home-cooked meal. And soon thereafter, every time this man of God, this prophet comes, Elisha comes through and strolling through this town, he stops at the one local diner that he knows, this lady's house, the, 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 lady, the lady from Shunem. And because of that, because he keeps coming back and because he keeps eating at her house, and I'm sure they're sitting and they have conversation over food, out of her kindness, she tells her husband, you know what, I think this guy is something special. I think this guy must be a holy man of God. He must be a prophet of God. And in that little statement, she's showing us something about herself. She's showing us that she is a woman of faith who is living her faith under all the circumstances and the situations of her life. She's not afraid, no matter what the problems are. She has a life to live, and she's going to live it. And I'd like to say somehow, some way, that she's made up her mind that she's going to stop stopping short, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what the problem is. She's going to live life, and she's going to share it with everybody else. So she sits down with her husband one day, and she has a conversation with him. And she says, hubby, what do you think? Do you think we could build, build onto our house? Let's add onto our house. Can we add like a second floor to our house for this man of God so whenever he comes by, he has a familiar place, a warm place, a welcoming place. And as I read through that, I got to ask the question, who thinks like that? I mean, really, who thinks like that? Let's add on to our house. And when my wife says to me, honey, I think we should add on to the house, there's probably a good reason why she wants me to add on to the house. Because we have a prolific family and we have this onslaught of grandbabies coming all the time. We just need extra room. Praise God. But who, who adds on to their house for a stranger that comes by? But she does. She says, let's add on to the house. Let's add on a room just for him. Which leads me to start to think, how many times, how many times when you had a situation, a crisis, a circumstance, a problem in your life, how many times do you think about other people? 
See, most often we think only about ourselves. And we think what's happening, the good, the bad, the indifferent. We think about us. But this lady, she starts thinking about other people and their needs and what might be beneficial for them. And in amongst that, she becomes kind of this home decorator. For on the second floor apartment of this new add-on house, she has four things. And I started to think to myself, why does God tell us in his holy word about these four things that she says we need in this house? Which takes me back to the very beginning of this. Why do we have this one little segment of scripture if it's not relevant for us today? Why do we have to hear about this great work of Elisha and this woman who has no children? Because God's still speaking to us today. And there's a reason that he tells us about these four things. So let me just see if I can break this down. The first thing she says is there needs to be a bed. Well, the bed represents a place of rest. Well, sometimes we rest on our laurels, even though I don't know what a laurel is. <laughs> and sometimes we rest on our abilities and our gifts, and we rest on our finances, and we rest on our, 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 our social security, and we rest on our, our investments, and we rest, rest on our retirement. But let me tell you, until we become dissatisfied with the busyness and the activities of this life, and we learn to abide, and we learn to rest, just rest in the presence of God, we'll always be dissatisfied. We need to learn to rest on God's approval rather than man's approval. The second thing in the room is a table. And that represents a, a place of communion, a place of fellowship, a, a place to be fed. Sometimes we want the presence of God in our lives, but we don't want to take time to be fed. We don't want to take time to commune. We don't want to have fellowship with Jesus. I mean, take exact, Zacchaeus, for example. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus, just like Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus wanted to see his power. He wanted to see the miracles. He wanted to see the workings of Jesus. All the while, Jesus wanted something else. Jesus just wanted to sit with Zacchaeus. He just wanted to have fellowship with Zacchaeus. See, Jesus does desire to use us, but first, he desires to commune with us. Just be with us. Hang out with us. Friends, there can be no presence of God in our lives if there's not time to commune and fellowship and dine with the Savior. You can't just come here and eat and run. You can't just come here and come and dine. You need to spend some time with Him. You need to kick off your shoes, put your feet up, relax, and enjoy. The third thing in the room is a chair. The chair is a, uh, a, represents a place of total support. It's a picture of total dependence on our ability to be held up. In other words, in order to have the presence of God in our lives, we've got to come to the place where we're going to rely on Him to hold us up all the time. Where we live, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, instead of just quoting it every once in a while, do not depend on our own understanding. Malachi chapter 3, verse 11 reads like this. You rulers govern for the bribes you can get. You priests teach God's law only to, for a price. You prophets won't prophesy unless you are paid. Yet you all claim that you're depending on the Lord. See, way too often, way too many of us are like this. We do our own thing, and then we ask God for his support to show up. Instead of for each one of us to ask what God's doing, and then to show up in what he's doing. And the fourth thing that's in that room is a lamp. Well, the lamp represents the word, the word of God, illumination. Uh, I can't have the presence of God without the light of the word. Without knowing his word, you can't know him. Jeremiah realized that when God's word brought a, a permanent fire in his bones. David realized that God's word produces protection from sin. He said, because I have hid your word in my heart that my, I might not sin against you. And God's word also brought direction. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Some of you are waiting to try and trying to find out what to do. Trying to find out your next move and how you're supposed to handle life and how you're supposed to handle that situation and that problem and that dilemma and that circumstance in your life. Well, I'm going to tell you, why not just read the written word and find out for yourself? 
Elisha was so pleased with the compassion and the servant heart of this woman that he asked what he could do for her. He said, do you want me to go talk to the king for you? Do you want me to go talk to the commander of the army? Do you want me to give you extra protection? You see, because he knew something. He knew something about this lady. And he was about to find out. She was ostracized with everybody. She was looked down upon everybody because she was barren. It doesn't matter if you're barren spiritually or physically or mentally or emotionally. There's some people who are barren in every area. This lady was barren physically. She didn't have any children. She needed somebody to take care of her, Elisha thought, and so he offered her that. She says, no, 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 that's okay. My family will take care of me. She, in other words, no, I, I got all I need. No, I, I, I've learned to live this way. No, I, I'll make it. No, I'll be okay. Have you ever done that? Someone came up to you, a brother, sister in Christ, and they said, how you doing? And you said, oh, I'm okay. Deep down inside, you're dying. Deep down inside, you're just, you're just falling apart. Deep down inside, you just want to crawl in a hole, and you just want to cry. And you come out, and you outwardly lie. Oh, I'm, I'm okay. That was her response. See, even in her love for the things of God, she comes really close at this point to stopping short. She knew what burned deep down inside of her. She knew how empty she was, that empty hole in her life. She knew how it felt to be so totally incomplete. But in her humbleness, she kept it to herself. So Elisha, Elisha asked his servant Gehazi sometime later, he says, what do you think we can do for her? And Gehazi says, well, she doesn't have a son. It'd be good if she had a son. But here's the problem. Her husband, he's, he's too old. Now, I don't know what too old is anymore, but, so we're not going to go there today. Okay, I don't know how old you have to be not to have children anymore, but he's too old, okay? She evidently is not that old. So he says, good. Tell her to come. Tell her to come again. And I don't know if you caught it, but this is what the word says, and I like this. It says, Elisha said to her as she stood in the doorway. Did you catch that? She's standing in the doorway. There's a door open. As she's standing in the doorway, she can come or she can go. And the same is true for you, because I believe in God's opening a door for you. He's opening the door. You're standing in the doorway today. You've come in through the house, in through the doors, into this house, and God's speaking to you today about that situation, about that circumstance, that dilemma, that problem, that one that you've been trying to hide, that you don't want anybody to know about, that you think everybody will just gloss over. But deep down inside, you're, you're dying inside. Deep down inside, it's crushing you. It's suffocating you. We do that as a church. We compare ourselves to everybody else. We look at the church down the road, oh, they're so much bigger. Oh, they're so much richer. Oh, they're so much smarter. Oh, they are. Who cares? Today, we're in the doorway. Listen to me, Lutheran Church of the Master. We're in the doorway. We can either walk in or we can walk back out. Because the word of the prophet said, this time, next year, you're going to be holding a son in your hands. To hear a response, oh, don't do that to me. Oh, don't tease me like that. Oh, oh, don't get my hopes up. Oh, that sounds too good to be true. Oh, wouldn't that be nice if it really happened? See, that's not faith. I believe God has this word right here in the scriptures, and we're standing in the doorway today. I believe God's opening a door for us to walk through. God's about to do something new. God's about to birth something in her, taking away her shame, taking away her guilt, taking away her reproach, setting her on a new path, giving her life. And the Bible says at that time next year, the, that following year, she was holding that son in her hands. Never saw that happen, did you? Too good to be true? Can God still do that in you today? Can God still do that in us 
today? Remember how I started? Just about the time you think it's too late. Just about the time you think your chances have failed. Just about the time you think you should give up, settle down, calm down, or slow down. Just about the time you think you should throw in the towel, sit in the dugout, park your car, give it a rest. I'm telling you, God's doing something new here at Lutheran Church of the Master. God's birthing something you didn't think was possible. God's forming something you never expected. God's creating something you never saw coming. Stop stopping short. Push through. Press up. Pull hard. Will you pray with me? Father, it's a new day. It's a new day. It's a new time. There's a new adventure just awaiting us. And I believe that you're birthing something brand new in us. Father, it, it, might, it, might, it, it might seem like a year is an awfully long time to wait. But this I know. Though I've never carried a belly in my womb, I, 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 I take such great joy in hearing of women as they talked about, I know sometimes there was morning sickness and sometimes they were just nauseous, and, uh, but, but soon they started feeling that life moving inside of them. And that life gave them a, excitement. There was something to hold and behold and something that eventually would be there to be held. And Father, I know that your word is so true. And I know that you're speaking to us today. You're speaking. You're birthing something in us today. And I, I, I'm going to mark it down on my calendar. Because this time next year, we're going to be holding it. We're going to be holding it ourselves. And we're going to see the glory of the Lord come down. And we're going to see the presence of the Lord fill the house. And we're going to see, Holy Spirit, you doing things we never thought possible. We never dreamt of. Let your word be true, and all men liars. God, do something in each man and woman and child in this very room today. Wherever they're hurting, wherever they're dying inside, wherever they're unsure, wherever they're afraid, speak to them today through this word. Seal it. Seal this word in their heart that you're birthing something new. Don't quit. Don't give up. Today's, you're conceiving something new in us. Praise and thanks to you, Jesus, in your precious name.